All right. Yes. So the bottom line is we publish our latest result after years of data collection and data analysis on um, the primordial gravitational wave imprints on cosmic micro background BMOS polarization. So we now um, produce, as Andrea said, the world's leading constraint on tensor to scalar ratio. Tensor is just another word for primordial gravitational waves. Uh, at le a little less than 4% uh, at two sigma confidence. Uh, so this result ruled out uh, a lot of uh, once promising inflationary models, but not all of them. So this is an exciting result from a mid-sized collaboration, about 50 people. I wanna acknowledge that. This is our last live in-person meeting at Caltech a few years ago. And also we have uh, local authors, co-authors on the paper uh, at uh, Stanford's lab right here. So this is really a tough assignment because we just have a number of high tech colloquials on this subject. So we gave a group talk a few months ago, uh, right after the data was uh, published. Um, and then Zish just gave another excellent talk on the same subject. Uh, two weeks ago. So I'm running into kind of like a tough spot here. What do I do for Encore? I, I, I can't talk this. Really. These are all well presented and uh, well received. So I decided to focus a little bit on inflation itself. What exactly are we trying to measure? So of course, in the title, I try to spice it up. Um, it's uh, studying the unknowable. And of course, I was referring to what uh, Fred Hoyle said 60, 70 years ago, uh, he, in the process of inventing the word Big Bang, he also said the hypothesis that all matter was created in one Big Bang, that's the first use of a word, at a particular time was irrational and outside science. So we'll come back to this. So you've heard about this a few times. If you came to uh, the Kaipak Colloquium. So the motivation for inflation was the observed. To a very high degree, the observed universe is very uniform. It's flat, spatially flat than necessary. Uh, and it's free of topological defects that some people said must have existed since the early universe. So if there is a, a hypothesized period of very rapid exponential expansion, it satisfactorily explain uh, all these properties. And a dynamical process uh, rooted in general relativity uh, can provide such um, rapid expansion, exponent, exponential expansion, if you had a scalar field that rolled down uh, very slowly, sufficiently slowly. So this was uh, inflation. So as a bonus, uh, inflation also predicts density perturbation with the properties observed uh, in large scale structure and cosmic micro events. So a little bit more on inflation, that the universe is expanding, the horizon is growing as the university, as the universe ages. Uh, so this red line represents the horizon. That's the, the, the observable universe. So all the stuff is falling into this horizon um, and so far so good. But if you look at the very beginning, um, something funny is happening. So you see all these timelines, world lines of the galaxies that are falling into our horizon right now used to, be, used to lie outside of our horizon. So that means we and them could not talk to each other because of the, the age of the universe. And something must have happened to make the universe look pretty much the same everywhere. So this is a different way of saying, uh, of uh, presenting the horizon problem. And how does uh, exponential exp uh, ex expansion fix that? So an exponential expansion looks like this, uh, if you're going in, the, in this direction in time, but effectively you're squeezing, you're pushing down all these lines into the horizon. Uh, if you just look at the early universe. 
So that gives all the materials, all the galaxies, raw materials, the galaxies, and so on, planet, everything, basically, a chance to come into thermal equilibrium and behave similarly. So that explains the, the observed large and uh, uniform universe. So similarly, an expansion that explodes a tiny region into a giant universe explain the observed flatness. So like I said, the required expansion can be achieved with a slowly varying scalar field, sufficiently slowly varying. Um, and it's just directly coming out of general relativity. So it's okay if you don't do this every day, but it's analogous to the Poisson equation in uh, classical physics. So if you calculate the source term uh, for the Poisson equation, general relativity version, uh, for a scalar field, this is what you get, basically kinetic energy and potential energy, and you plug it into the equation, and you get this. It's just that simple. When you have a scalar field and it's roughly constant, the potential energy of it gives you a Hubble expansion and with a constant Hubble. So that, that gives you an exponential expansion. So the observed universe is, has this spectral density uh, distribution that's roughly scale invariant um, over vast uh, um, scales. So that demands the scalar field to be slowly rolling uh, over what we call um, many uh, E foldings. And this tells you, this, this is kind of rare in physics. When you add a constant in the potential, usually it does nothing in physics. But in this case, when you add a constant uh, to a potential, it changes the expansion rate because it's gravity, gravity interacts with even the constant. Okay, so we'll come back to this point later. But the key point is when you inject a potential energy, it create, creates inflation. So, and this also gives an opportunity to produce the perturbation, the fluctuations we see today. For each Fourier mode in linear regime, each Fourier mode evolves independently. During inflation, the Fourier mode leaves the horizon, okay, one by one, depending on the wavelengths. And after the inflation ends, these Fourier modes return back into the horizon. And each one gets an amplitude randomly assigned um, by uncertainty principle. Okay, so each Fourier mode gets an amplitude, but the solution looks like this. Okay, so this is a linear solution whose amplitude is assigned just by chance. So not only scalar field works this way, tensor also works this way. And when I said um, uncertain principle, it means the ground state of vacuum assign a random fluctuation to this amplitude, and it just evolves based on classical uh, equation of motion, okay? So think of this as a series of Fourier modes. Each one had a solution like this, different phase, different amplitude assigned randomly. And that's what we get. And this later on evolves into the fluctuation, temperature fluctuation in cosmic microwave background, we see today. And later on, C for structural formation uh, in galaxies, which then produce planets, people, and so on. Hubble D field. So this is a result of that uh, quantum fluctuation. All right. So the key ingredient for this story is a scalar field that rolls sufficiently slowly down the hill. So in the original version of inflation, it was thought that a field stuck in false vacuum would give rise to such constant um, potential and therefore roughly constant uh, Hubble uh, and inflation. But this, uh, oh, inflation does not end really, okay? And of course, uh, four years ago, the new inflation was proposed, which was spectacular. 
when you don't have um, a false vacuum, just uh, just a, a field that changes sufficiently slowly, and you get the same thing. A little bit more into that math, very simple, just just calculus of scalar field rolling down the hill. Like I said, to zero's order, the Hubble is given by the potential itself, okay, including all the constants and on everything. And then to first order, the slope uh, gives you a quantity called epsilon, and the curvature gives you a quantity called eta, and these quantities are observed to be small. So these quantities have to be small to be with the observation. And then uh, comes with it the tensor um, fluctuation that I was talking about. It, the amplitude is directly proportional to Hubble during inflation or um, the potential, uh, potential energy of the field, input time field. And then the scalar field um, also acquire fluctuation in exactly identical way uh, with um, this uh, epsilon factor in the denominator. So when you take the tensor to scalar ratio, um, you just get epsilon during inflation basically with a numerical constant 16 in front. Um, and also when you try to calculate the spectral index, um, when the input time field was rolling down, you also can express the spectral index in terms of these so-called slow roll parameter and the deviation from scale invariance, um, unity uh, in the spectral index uh, is given by uh, epsilon and eta, okay? So this is the spectrum, scalar spectrum was measured to spectacular precision by Planck. So this is uh, expressed in multiples, um, Fourier multiples, a uh, spectrum Fourier multiples. And uh, this is uh, TT, the temperature fluctuation power spectrum and the TE fluctuation power spectrum measured by Planck a few years ago. So it was processed from that initial spectrum. It was processed by very well-known linear physics. And there's very little astrophysics uh, in the way. So you can imagine taking this spectrum and do an inversion of this, okay? You invert this, um, throwing in the initial spectrum and see which one produced uh, this uh, bump and wiggle, okay? So in this, in, after this inversion, uh, you get, essentially you deconvolve the well-known linear physics uh, to get the primordial spectrum for a scalar. And this is what we've been getting uh, over the last 30 years since Kobe, then WMAP and Planck, okay? Looks like this is a uh, nearly scale invariant, slightly red over very broad linear uh, scale. And then you can imagine inverting this one more time to get the infotime potential and they went ahead and did it, the Planck people. And this is what they got, okay? So linear spectrum, uh, CMB and isotropy, so the linear spectrum, linear spectrum go to uh, the input time potential and they went ahead and reconstruct, try to reconstruct what scalar potential was needed to produce the linear power spectrum that they reconstructed uh, from CMB temperature. And this is what they got. So this is as direct as it gets to measuring um, inflation, V of five. And indeed, they mostly measure the slope and curvature. And there's a lot of you know, uncertainties still, um, but this is a you know, very honest reconstruction of the in inflation potential. And also this slightly red spectrum um, agrees very well. Okay, I have to read it now. This slightly spec red spectrum agrees very well with general prediction of uh, inflation. In addition, um, this is expressed in terms of power spectrum, uh, meaning it's Gaussian. And if you test the Gaussianity of this fluctuation, 
uh, it's very, very Gaussian to a high degree. In addition, uh, this is also consistent with what we call adiabatic fluctuation. And um, this is a signature of fluctuation growing out of a single field, the vacuum uh, distribution of a single field. And I'll get back to that point a little bit later. There are different ways of measuring Gaussianity corresponding to different inflation physics. Uh, and so far, they all been measured to be consistent with known Gaussianity. And again, the Gaussianity is also a signature of um, this fluctuation being growing out of the vacuum state of a single scalar quantum field. Okay. All right. So there have always been minor but very local objections to inflation. Um, so as a dynamical process rooted in GR, you wouldn't think so. This is just physics, right? This comes out of physics. And we know scalar field exists and we know GR is correct. So why are there so many resistance to inflation? Um, so it has something to do with uh, fine tuning or naturalness, which I'll get to in a bit. But in addition, you know, people are just in general uncomfortable when you're trying to study creation uh, in science. Um, also, uh, Andre here is a big uh, proponent, but um, naturally inflation implies creation of the universe can happen over and over again. Because once you describe it in terms of the dynamical process, if the same condition arises, it'll just happen again. So to me, this is a very, very solid logical conclusion, um, but it leads to a lot of uh, uncomfortable uh, discussion. Uh, but I, I see it as a very sound logic. It's, it's almost unavoidable. Um, but when you mention the word multiverse, meaning the universe getting created over and over again, uh, there's a lot of uh, pushback and uh, even declaration that such discussion is uh, outside science. This is very, um, it, this re really reminded me of uh, Fred Hoyle's objection to Big Bang. Um, the same claim that it's outside science. But again, to me, it seems very long. So coming back to the point whether inflation is fine tuned or natural, um, aside from you know, the general pushback. Um, this is kind of a, a fair question to ask. So after all, inflation was proposed to explain uh, the observed phenomena being fine-tuned, if there is fine-tuning. Fine-tuning in inflation, it's fair to ask whether it's um, reasonable to replace one form of fine-tuning by another, right? So you could just say, okay, so everything was fine-tuned anyway if inflation was fine-tuned, so why do we uh, still need inflation? So there are two aspects of naturalness slash fine-tuning uh, related to inflation. Uh, the first one is related to the initial condition of inflation. And the second one is uh, the potential itself or the Lagrangian equation that describes uh, inflation being fine-tuned. So there's a lot of progress in this. Um, but it's not very well reported outside of just closed physics uh, circles. Uh, in the meantime, um, Roger Penrose has won the Nobel Prize, and uh, inflation seems to be his favorite subject to talk about. And he just makes claims that um, inflation is not scientific, it's a fantasy, and so on. That's part of the reason why I agree to give this talk. <laughs> so, initial conditions. Um, Penrose's objection to inflation was mostly he considered um, just filling the world with uh, infantile field as unnatural or fine tuned as the phenomena that inflation is trying to explain. Okay. And there's a lot of progress in this uh, since the early, you know, 10 wave discussion. So, in fact, people have been using numerical relativity. Uh, to study how natural um, these uh, initial conditions are. Because it does require some sort of 
special condition for inflation to occur out of randomness, okay? And before these tools became available, you can only talk really. So for 40 years, people just talk, oh, that's reasonable, that's fine tuned, so on and so forth. Um, but I, I do think these series of papers that use general relativity to study how likely it is to, from randomness, um, produce a homogeneous and isotropic inflated universe um, was uh, were very important. And um, so the first paper was done here. Um, so Andrea was uh, a co-author and also, uh, also Leonardo was a co-author on these papers. And it lead to more and more complicated um, calculations that involves not only the scatter field fluctuating, but also the tensor field, um, large tensor field perturbation as well. But the general conclusion has been uh, inflation tend to be robust and uh, can arise from um, fairly general conditions. It does, it's not nearly as fine tuned as the phenomena uh, inflation was trying to explain. Talking through the mask is difficult. On to the potential itself. So once we publish the paper, that's here. At the same time, there was a coverage by PRL uh, website and a third party author um, wrote a, an article on the implication of the bicep result. Uh, with a title squeezing down the theory space for cosmic inflation i didn't the article was very well written so i didn't read too much to the title at the time but later on looking at the twitter responses i realized there's a different way of interpreting the title saying inflation is in big trouble so if you look at the title again now that's all you can think of okay inflation is being ruled out that's According to the title. And it gets worse than this. Because then there's a CNN article with a title that says the problem with Big Bang Theory. Okay. And when I was reading this, I was like, oh, interesting. What now? Then I realized, huh, a laboratory at the South Pole is causing scientists to revisit their theories. And I was like, Okay, interesting. I also have a project at the South Pole. <laughs> then my amusement and bemusement turned to panic when I realized he was talking about bicep split. Okay, and the interpretation was the failure to detect FEMO uh, spells trouble for inflation. Okay, that's another reason I gave this talk. All right. How about phi? Um, how about V of phi? Um, so theorists want to know whether the required form of V of phi is included in the current contenders of theory for quantum gravity, uh, theory of everything, uh, including supergravity uh, or the string inversion of that uh, string theory, uh, superstring theory. And also, is it natural? In other words, not fine tuned to have such a flat potential um, in um, the context of, of quantum gravity. So, what we do with bicep collaboration and all the CMB experiments uh, directly measures this um, height uh, of the potential. Okay. And first of all, if you know the energy scale of this phenomena, you know where to fit into the particle physics world. There's a Planck scale, there's electrical weak symmetry breaking somewhere in between and duck tail. And inflation could be above that or below that. Where is it? Once you know the energy, you have some indication. And also, it turns out uh, late 90s, um, it was realized that if you observe this curly, uh, curl uh, beam of polarization, uh, the amplitude of that is proportional, directly proportional to ten tensor. And as we discussed, tensor is proportional to the energy scale 
of the of the import chain. Okay, so this is what I've been doing uh, for the twenty plus years, um, and um, we measure the linear polarization on the sky. We separate them into E mode and B mode, and we make power spectrums and see if the B mode power spe spectrum peaks above zero um, in the presence of all the foregrounds and so on. And uh, the latest result from BK, um, bicep three keg, um, still produce a limit that's consistent with all of the B mode coming from Lenzi, um, which is the second order effect produced by scalar. Okay. So that allows us to constrain um, the tensor um, below certain level and the most convenient plot to tell us something about inflation is this uh, R versus NS. NS is uh, the spectral index for scalar. Uh, so these are the two parameters most related to inflation. And um, this is the current one sigma and two sigma constraints coming from uh, BK18, okay? So there's this class of model called natural inflation uh, getting you know, ruled out essentially. And there's this uh, class of uh, monomial, single field monomial um, models also getting pushed out by the combination of uh, lack of gravitational wave and slightly red spectrum. And uh, if you look at the history of the measurement, uh, in the vertical direction, you realize um, the bicep uh, in the last certainly 10 years, um, the bicep experiment has been producing that limit, okay? So this is the time-lapse um, constraint um, circa uh, 2014, eight years ago. Uh, we have this constraint. And then one year after that, um, what we call BK14 strung. And so then- Someone's missed the video now. Three years after that, 2018, we have this limit. And then this is our latest result, um, BK18, mostly coming from a 95 gigahertz experiment at by, uh, measurement uh, by bicep three. So, Two very interesting classes of models uh, have been disfavored, um, but that doesn't mean inflation is in trouble, okay? In fact, there's still an infinite number of inflationary models uh, that still fit the observation, almost by definition, but it'll be too quick to claim, oh, that just means inflation is dodging, okay? So that, really means it's um it's it's not inflation's fault it's physics fault right because if you had a quantum gravity theory you can immediately rule out inflation like that whether your quantum uh, gravity theory can produce inflation or not um and if it doesn't produce phenomena like this it's out so you have to look elsewhere to explain the flatness horizon problem and the spectral index uh, that we observe, but we don't have that. So you kind of have to like look for inflation in here. And all we've got uh, is the slope. So far it's the slope and curvature of that. So it'll be very helpful to, if you know the, the energy. So where is inflation? Okay, in this. So we know it's not here. It's probably not about trunk scale, so it's somewhere in here. It's also kind of unique as a particle physics, if you will, experiment. So usually in physics, um, if you can't see something, you just claim it's too small, it's still there, you just can't see it. In particle physics, it's the opposite. If you can't see something, you said, oh, the energy scale is too high to be seen, right? Because you apply particles to certain energy, you can't see it, it means the energy is too high. New physics is still out there. So, but the combination of that 
uh, particle physics type of constraint. And what we do, I uh, kind of squeeze down on inflation, right? Because you say, all right, we can't detect inflation. So it must be down here. Uh, we can't detect emo, so it must be down here. But as you push it down, down, it gets dangerously low because we know it's above electro weak symmetrization scale because we think we know everything about electro weak symmetry breaking. So you're kind of pushing it down this way and pushing it up that way. It's going to sandwich it, uh, inflation somewhere in between. So it's kind of very complementary and unique uh, as a particle endeavor. All right, so I've read a lot of papers over the last month or so, uh, probably to prepare for this program. So I, um, I think it's impossible to discuss why theorists are so excited about this result without talking about naturalness, as it turns out. Um, so this is a model proposed in 1990, um, 30 years ago, it's called natural uh, inflation. For the longest time, I don't understand why it's called natural uh, inflation. To me, it's an axiom. It is an axiom producing inflation. It looks just like an axiom, and the functional form directly comes from uh, Pratek Q symmetry, symmetry version. Uh, and it was called. Um, a uh, natural inflation um, because they're trying to use a symmetry, a high level symmetry to eliminate high order terms, okay? So this was viewed as natural um, because the curvature of inflation, which is that eta parameter we discussed, uh, corresponds to incoton mass and it's so much lower uh, than the pump mass. And this was thought to be a way to explain that because symmetry is involved and symmetry can prohibit um, high order terms. Okay, so this is how particle physicists view symmetry uh, and naturalness. And it's obvious to all the particle physicists around here, but it was not obvious to me and it was not obvious probably to a lot of the non particle theorists. So I feel like it was useful to. Explain that a little. So that natural inflation, even before we kind of ruled it out now, a few months ago, was falling out of favor because um, theorists couldn't quite produce that potential uh, in the context of string theory and supergravity and whatever your favorite model of quantum gravity is. Uh, it was thought to be impossible uh, to produce that sort of uh, potential. Uh, in string theory. So the two most influential contemporary inflation models um, were the string motivated uh, axiom monodromy model and also the SUGA uh, inspired alpha attacker uh, models. And um, I'm saying this not because, you know, the advocates and proposers for this theorist were my colleagues here in the you know, Stanford Physics Department. Uh, but because they are truly uh, influential. And generally, um, these good models, they don't just draw up a potential, right? Mathematical potential that has low enough, small enough slope and small enough curvature because a high school student, student could have done that, right? So it doesn't take a string theorist to draw up a potential uh, that fits uh, the observation. In general, they want to avoid high, high level of fine tuning or achieve naturalness, either by evoking symmetry or they want to see this uh, flat potential coming out from their quantum gravity condenser theory. Okay. And right now, um, these models have been broadly characterized into so-called the large field inflation uh, and the small field uh, inflation. And there is a nice relation 
between the measured um, V um, or the Hubble or the inflation energy scale and the range uh, for phi field uh, to change or to move uh, during inflation. So this condition is called the light condition. It's just a simple integral, okay? That relates um, the curvature and the gradient of this field and the absolute value um, and, um, and the number of e folding required during inflation. So put in reasonable number of e folding uh, for inflation to explain what we see, you have a one-to-one -one relationship uh, between these two, assuming a single field. Okay, and this is a big deal for a lot of the theorists um, because um, going back to the naturalness, again, I did not understand it uh, in the past, but going back to the naturalness argument, um, it might be helpful to read this before looking at the picture. Uh, particle theorists often quoted these two lines uh, to explain naturalness. Um, first of all, everything not forbidden is compulsory, okay? And then, secondly, a dimensionless quantity in nature should be small unless that phenomena is suppressed by higher symmetry. So the two things are, in fact, you know, very similar if you think about it. Okay, so with that in mind, Again, particle theorists, I apologize, you all know this, but a lot of us don't, didn't. So with that in mind, you can start to appreciate why they care about this. Because an inflaton potential um, in a unified theory should really look like this. It has higher order terms. And if you don't have symmetry to prohibit these terms from happening, they must be there. They must be order unity. I'm not saying, you know, this has to be right, but according to naturalness uh, and fine tuning argument, uh, that's the um, that's the natural way of uh, of uh, thinking about it. However, um, we know the infoton field must not look like this. It's very flat and very small curvature, and worse yet. Um, because of that light condition, um, if the R is large enough to be detectable, the amount of range, the inflaton field uh, moved during inflation is several times the Planck mass, okay? And you, know, you need this while naturally you anticipated this. And it seems very hard to get this out of any um, quantum gravity theory. Um, according to this, using the naturalness uh, argument. Um, so um, these, my colleagues here, uh, they uh, discovered uh, one such way to avoid that uh, anticipation. So they successfully identified an object in string theory. You can't ask me more about that really because I don't really understand what these means, but they, um, they observe a phenomena um, uh, in string theory that could lead to a field moving over many, many Planck masses, um, basically encircling a tube, basically, without changing the physics much. And you can just move many, many Planck masses uh, by doing that. And that gives you a very, very flat potential even though the anticipation is something complicated like this. So this was that first influential uh, set of models called uh, axion monodromy. Okay. And it's just amazing that we were able to say something about this theory. Okay. So they didn't propose like an explicit model or something, but based on this um, setup, they were able to predict uh, inflationary, the level of inflationary um, gravitational wave uh, could be such and such uh, high uh, if uh, NS is small and low if NS is high. 
Okay, so that allows an opportunity for us to constrain it. And now it looks like the single field version of these models uh, is now disfavored uh, by bicep three tech data. You can add another field, uh, and uh, that's what uh, this paper is about, and that kind of resurrects uh, this uh, this model. But uh, the single field uh, axion monodromy appears to be disfavored by the latest uh, bicep count. There are also attempts to, because we, we need small slope and small curvature. So just, can we just look for the inflection point uh, in, a, in a general model? And they went out and did that uh, in the context of uh, the brain uh, inflation. They literally find the inflection point and the point where, where you have small slope. And the general conclusion of that exercise is you can do that. You can find places where it will inflate and produce what we see. Um, however, it requires cancellation among several hundreds of uh, terms uh, mathematically to produce a potential that flat. So fine tuning was not really avoided. Uh, but it can be done, okay? So sadly, this class of model produced like pretty much neg negligible R, uh, but it does produce inflation. So this is still a valid model, even though it has some fine tuning in it, but maybe it's not avoidable. A second class of uh, influential model was, uh, uh, was the alpha attractor model. So as far as I can understand it, it was motivated by supergravity. Again, you're trying to produce inflation uh, in your quantum gravity model, quantum gravity theory. And uh, this was proposed by Renata and Andre uh, nearly 10 years ago. Um, uh, what they found uh, was um, if you just change the kinetic term uh, for a scalar potential that we discussed in the first few slides, from the canonical form to a more exotic form. Um, then after some change of variables, uh, the it's effective potential for the new Lagrangian has, is flattened, is not flattened. So you start out from this, it could be anything. And if you just change the can canonical kinetic term, it just flattens out the effective potential. And apparently, um, this was a uh, allowed exercise in super gravity. You can answer questions for Andre here uh, if you have more questions. Uh, but it is a possibility that um, uh, super gravity has these uh, non canonical terms, um, non canonical kinetic terms. So that produces this class of models that still fits with the theory. Uh, with the, the observation. So the, the alpha could be anything from what I've read. And um, starting out with alpha being infinity, it goes to the canonical kinetic term. As you decrease alpha, um, uh, the amount of gravity wave uh, predicted is getting less and less uh, until it becomes zero, essentially. Um, again, I'm sure. Um, the theorists are not just being dodgy here. Uh, they're, they're finding new structures, um, new ways of generating the observed phenomena uh, in the context of quantum theory of quantum gravity. So uh, standard experimental slide, but like I said, we already talked about the experiment a few months ago, and then Zish talked about them. Um, just two weeks ago. Um, so basically we built big, um, or we, we call them small aperture telescope, but you can see one of those, two of those small aperture telescope in our lab, they look pretty big. Um, uh, 50 centimeter to one centimeter diameter aperture uh, in a class that we go out and measure linear polarization on the sky. Uh, we do vector analysis, uh, vector calculus, to separate emo and bemo, and we produce power spectrum, and we see if there's any bemo uh, after uh, you remove lensing uh, and foregrounds. So this is done uh, at the South Pole Station. 
um, because South Pole is a desert, there's very little water vapor, um, and there's like continuous darkness you can observe uh, without worrying about um, the sun uh, heating up parts of the structure and leading to uh, systematics or pickup. Okay, so here, this is the, the slide for you. So we just published uh, this result uh, taken up to uh, 2018, the end of 2018. Uh, we call it BK18. Um, and um, this corresponds to the big sensitivity improvement at 95 gigahertz provided by the BICEP3 experiment, which was built here. Um, and then, since then, we've collected three more years of data, okay? And uh, we're going to deploy a series of BICEP3 like um, receivers, um, completing in about two years. We have one, the first of the BICEP3 like uh, receiver, in addition to BICEP3 at the pole last year at 30, 40 gigahertz. And we're adding one more 95 gigahertz receiver, one more 150 gigahertz receiver, uh, and a high frequency 220 to 70 gigahertz receiver. So the sensitivity will continue integrating down over the next few years. So each one comes from a kick in sensitivity, improvement in sensitivity from adding new receivers. And also we'll be working with the South Pole Telescope uh, team uh, to the lens. Because if you remember the power spectrum, we're pretty much riding on the lensing spectrum now. Now you have to remove lensing to get better and better limit. Um, so this shows our one sigma R constraint with uh, versus without uh, de-lensing. So the first one is already at the South Pole. We have nicely labeled uh, unit two, three, four uh, in various labs uh, across the US. BA4 is currently in the lab. You know, let me know if you want to take a look. And this is um, the de-lensing uh, procedure proposed. You measure the amount of uh, intervening dark matter um, by looking at SPT high uh, frequent, high resolution uh, B mode and reconstruct the uh, what we call um, the deflection field, and you predict the amount of B mode generated by that deflection field lens into B mode, and you essentially subtract that, even though we don't do explicit subtractions here. Um, but um, to get to the D lens um, eventual sensitivity level, um, collaboration with the external data set is needed because uh, the bicep program doesn't have quite the resolution to do the lensing by itself. Um, so, this is what we think we will be able to achieve by the end of the program uh, in a few years. So, the current constraint. Um, that we just discussed now on logs, log scale, or linear scale, uh, but stretched out uh, is in blue. And um, in the two scenarios where there is a non-zero R versus zero R, uh, we'll be able to get down by another factor of three or four. Okay, so we're talking about now factor 10 from this program, but a factor of three or four. Um, we could get a factor of 10 if we had you know, 10 times more uh, receivers, okay? And um, that's what uh, the stage four CMB project uh, is trying to do, but that, you know, that, that's not going to start uh, uh, in like, until like eight years. Okay, so this program is a funded uh, project that should be able to deliver this uh, result in red in a couple of years. And this was that alpha attractor uh, model I was talking about. So of all the 50 citations we have so far over the last few months, um, this one also caught my eye. 
um, they use the constraint on R and NS to predict that the spectrum should have a running in it, meaning it has a curvature. Um, I haven't read the entire paper yet, um, but they seem to be really confident that for a single field, um, by constraining the first and second derivatives, they're trying to say something about the third derivative and not, uh, being non-trivial. And things like this can definitely be detectable in future generation CMB projects like CMB Explorer. Okay. Any questions so far? So let me come back to that after the yeah. So um like I said, certain or even most of uh, inflation model could potential could appear uh, fine tuned uh, or even the initial condition to a lesser extent. Um, but I want to point out that there are a lot of unexplained naturalness or fine tuning problems um, piling up in physics anyway. There's cosmological constant, there's inflation that we were discussing, there's big math sometimes known as the hierarchy problem. Um, there's also strong CP. So maybe, you know, um, we shouldn't pay too much attention to these naturalness issues, uh, especially some naturalness are probably explained by anthropic selections. Uh, famously, the cosmological constant and inflation, of course, it's about creation. So um, we need to create an observer. Um, so there might be some selection effect in there. And also Higgs mass has well-documented uh, selection, uh, anthropic selection uh, processes involved. Uh, however, strong CP seems to be the one that defy all anthropic explanations so far. So, and so far, the best explanation for strong CP uh, is still uh, eczema. So again, strong CP, um, there are two CP violating uh, processes in standard model. And one is already observed to be uh, CP violating. And that's what Babar and so on uh, have measured. And the other one produces exactly zero CP violation. And going back to the naturalness principle, um, if you can use symmetry to forbid a term, dimensionless term, um, then you can explain why the dimensionless term is small. But in this case, you already use uh, CP, uh, or, or I should say CP is already violated. So you can't use CP to enforce um, strong interaction that's small um, CP because it's already violated in other sectors. Um, so the only, I would say, the widely accepted explanation for strong CP problem, or in other words, um, the lack of neutral, uh, neutron uh, dipole moment uh, is uh, exonized. So there is a surprising, um, at least surprising to me, interaction between exion uh, and calcium microbiome. So, so we you, we use B mode uh, power spectrum to constrain um, inflationary gravity waves. What about these E modes? Can we learn something from these? So it turns out the bumps and wiggles um, in EE spectrum and TT. Uh, comes from the fact that 
the initial fluctuation we observe uh, is adiabatic. And exion in the presence of, during inflation, the presence of exion um, would violate that because uh, they create isocurvature fluctuations. So standard prediction is, um, is in dash line. And any additional component during inflation, for example, if you had exion during inflation, uh, you kind of smear out the peaks and troughs uh, of, uh, of, uh, of EE spectrum. And TT, but uh, much more pronounced in EE. And the bicep series of experiments can measure EE much better and then, then Plunk already did. So you can imagine if you have a single degree of freedom, uh, inflation, and that's all you have to create fluctuations. Uh, you can just say you have a string instrument and you pluck it in a very peculiar way at T of zero, um, but the string is at rest and you just let go, okay? <laughs> All right. It doesn't like that slide for some reason. Okay, you can have an arbitrary shake uh, initially, um, but it it is a still a very particular way uh, of uh, of fluctuation because going back to the Fourier mode, right? So each Fourier mode evolves independently because this is also linear. Um, but even though it has arbitrary amplitudes or phase, uh, arbitrary amplitudes at T of zero, um, each one evolves at rest, starting at rest and oscillate. And if you analyze the motion, this represents just half of the possible motion because um, this is analogous to a single variable perturbation um, in the universe. Um, and this appears to be what we observe. And the interpretation is because we had one single impotent field that's doing the perturbation. Um, and if you just add initial velocity, going back to the string uh, music uh, instrument analogy, if you just add a linear initial velocity um, at T of zero, uh, you smear out the peaks and troughs. Uh, when you analyze the Fourier mode. Um, just by the lack of any of those non-adiabatic modes, we put fairly strong constraints on any other entities uh, that happen during inflation. So the best constraints so far came from Plunk, okay? But um, the bicep project can quickly uh, improve that measurement by doing a wide field survey. So we normally observe a small-ish patch of the sky to get the best possible measurement on B modes. Um, but um, we spent, just spent a summer doing wide field observation. And the expectation is we can quickly improve on uh, Planck um, air bars, uh, which uh, was the best, uh, which provided the best constraint on these non-adiabatic fluctuations. So we already have map to show for. So these are the Stokes Q and U parameter over 10% of the sky. Um, this is our normally observed uh, main deep field. And um, this is about four months of data. And we clearly see emails and uh, we wanna plot the power spectrum to see if uh, there's any small level of smearing uh, from um, non-adiabatic fluctuations. So there is um, underappreciated synergy between axion uh, and inflation because we think inflation happened and PCD axion seems to be the most widely acceptable way to explain the strong CP problem. 
um, and you have to squeeze both uh, between the gut level and pump uh, scale. Okay, so one can go above the other. However, we now have pretty strong constraint on. Um, them being not at the same energy level, so to speak. Because if during inflation, there was a second degree of freedom in XNI, uh, you produce those isoperative nodes. And now we already constrained here to those isoperative nodes. And we're trying to constrain it further more. And that constraint naturally split the allowed axion being dark matter parameter space into two regions. Um, so one corresponds to small axion mass. So this is vert vertical axis is axion mass. Uh, and horizontal axis is uh, inflation energy. So this corresponds to small uh, inflation energy scale and small axion mass. And one corresponds to a uh, higher uh, inflation energy scale and therefore larger R. Uh, and certain fixed-ish uh, level of uh, QCD axion mass. Okay, if we can increase this, we're kind of squeezing down on the on the parameter space allowed uh, for this um, um, what we call post-inflation. That just means uh, axion physics happened after inflation, not before, and vice versa. Okay, if we can rule this out. And we still want axion to be the dark matter, um, then you can forget about detecting R because that corresponds to a very low level of inflationary energy scale. Uh, I think this, this um, very important synergy between inflationary energy scale and therefore R uh, and dark matter uh, should be uh, emphasized here. So, what's going on in here? So this is a model um, that has no more free parameter. So this model has QCD axion as the dark matter. It predicts a detectable potentially uh, R uh, in the CMBD mode. Um, so it's like a win-win for both dark matter community and CMB community. Um, so this corresponds to a few uh, gigahertz to a few tens of gigahertz uh, in frequency uh, for Exion. So during the pandemic, so this was my pandemic. I was in the pandemic, I sit around and think about these issues. Um, and um, in the past, in the past, so there's there are existing constraints on QCD Exion at around a gigahertz level. And scaling up to higher frequency has been difficult. Um, and um, because volume scales as lambda to the third power, and the spin rate scales as uh, volume squared. So to go from one gigahertz to five gigahertz, you lose an enormous amount of sensitivity. Okay. Unless you can somehow maintain a large volume at high resonant frequency. And, um, these are complicated looking structures are attempts to do that. Um, so the paper was written during the pandemic. Um, it, the basic idea is the coupling of volume from resonant frequency. Um, Okay, so after the pandemic and the lab reopened, we promptly went back to the lab, we built a prototype, and we uh, saw the resonance right away. So that's where we are. Um, there are lots of Okay. I've been speaking for a while. And um, all 
Okay. Anyway, come ask me if you're interested in this. Um, we're working with undergrads and um, rotating grad students um, in creating prototypes um, targeting uh, TCD axion searches at a few gigahertz to tens of gigahertz. And uh, we have already seen resonances and uh, we're talking about crazy looking resonant cavities like this uh, that can um, lead to uh, strong constraints. So, <laughs> I'll take questions. Hi. Huh. Yeah, I've got a small question about the slide where you're talking about map sensitivity as a function of like years for the for the bicep rotation. Why? I'm I'm wondering why sensitivity is like a continuous function of time rather than it just like you have a new system that's stored that's really better. So it requires integration, right? Mm -hmm. it, so when you just deploy an instrument, the integration time is zero. Um, so you start from mass sensitivity. You have to integrate for a while, but you do see a kick mm -hmm. right, in the slope, right? You see like a jerk in the slope um, when you deploy a new instrument. Then it kind of plateaus when you expect both of the instruments and the uh, newly deployed uh, repeat. So plateau is limited by like the actual resonance. Yeah. Sensitivity. Yeah. Sensitivity. Yeah. yeah. It is possible. So Tonk is an all sky uh, survey instrument in space. They did measure everywhere. Uh, and they found mostly by and large um, a uniform statistical distribution across the sky. So Bicep chose one to two percent of that to observe, to go deep. Uh, indeed, we, we can observe the entire sky and go deep at the same time. Um, we pick a region where galactic contamination is uh, small and we treat the go deep. And we're relying on the uniformity statistics of uh, by Tom uh, to search. So the B mode um, has an interesting property of um, it has no sample variance. Well, by that I mean if you see any B mode, if it's as long as it's above noise level, uh, you've detected uh, primordial gravity. So you want to really limit your survey area and go deep, and that's the, the first order principle. But we do rely on the same assumption. If the reason we have just happen to have, you know, no beam mode, then we're trying to cover, but you know, statistically that doesn't happen uh, because beam mode is also a problem. Well, we are already limited by lending at this point. So even just to reduce that uncertainty by a factor of two, um, we need to de-lend already. Okay, so we need to have to measure that deflection field uh, with high sensitivity, uh, the lens that, and in addition, we need to deploy all these other receivers uh, measuring the foreground uh, for component separation. So we need both. So right now, we're, I would say we're more limited by, slightly more limited by lensing than foreground. But after we de lens, we will be uh, more limited by foreground than lensing, and then we have to do both at the same time. And uh, that's why CMBS4 has two big telescopes and um, tens of uh, small telescopes to do both. One more question. 
probably is not the president of the Congress of debate about the hero, but there are new classes of people based on the implications of young people. And I know that it is important for the regulation Right now, your future grows in the same place where black goes. So, the situation of gender GM order can push it almost to one. And that sounds really crazy, but the implications are crazy. And you are can I accept in any way that you apply or you can state whatever it has to do by these people? So to be clear, that measurement of NS is mostly provided by Tom. Yes. And um, to improve on that, we need a high resolution uh, CMB experiment. Um, so the E mode power spectra uh, were not measured that well at high L. So you want to really measure the email process from to very high L, but even that can give you, you know, limited improvement only, not, uh, not a huge amount. So we're kind of getting like 60, 70 percent of all possible um, constraints out of CMD on NS. Um, although other surveys, um, like SPARIS, uh, you know, a satellite mission. Could uh, improve our measurement of NS um, by a factor larger than a theory. Um, so we, we could uh, conceivably uh, constrain these theories. There are also lots of theories um, without modification, just um, more focusing on astrophysics side of things based on the term discovery. Thank you. 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 Thank you.